good. Um, yeah, welcome to the presentation. Alma will respond to comments. Um, it is mainly about our experiences with uh, the Alma API in the last couple of years and um, the toolings we are currently building around um, the API and uh, abstractions we are um, using. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the pun is of course intended uh, as promises are a main concept in uh, JavaScript these days uh, for um, making um, asynchronous uh, processing more easily readable and uh, developable. So, good. Who we? Who are we? I mean, I think situation is a bit different uh, in in our um, case as uh, with other institutions. Um, we're the central entity uh, within the Austin Library Network, so we have a rather huge uh, network zone and uh, very very many um, institutional zones i think more, more than 50 uh, we also provide the local administration uh, of the institution zones so we do management of data including data correction coordinating efforts to fix things in the catalog making use uh, of rules, making use of API uh, to to do these things. Um, and yeah, we, have, we also provide the provisioning of Primo um, for more than 50, li 50 libraries uh, performing transition from network to Alma. We're almost done with that and we're quite happy because uh, that were a few very strenuous years moving all these institutions in nine ways um, to from Aleph to Alma. And this year is the last year of this. Um, and so we can now leverage uh, what we've learned uh, in this time. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, and then we have the integration with third party systems. Um, that's, uh, that's the part where we need the Alma API um, very often like um, integration of an expert annotation system we provide to our users or we provide together with a um, Swiss company, um, Eurospider it's called, um, it's an expert annotation system where they can provide um, keywords um, and uh, assistance uh, in enriching uh, catalog data basically. And uh, this is a live and online integration and a digital repository uh, system, Visual Library. We also build an integration there. And um, this is also live uh, via the API. So this is, um, this is I think, a, a, a model for, for integrating uh, with Alma. And uh, a last point where we need many, many requests uh, is uh, onboarding new institutions. It's like uh, when you migrate data from one system, map it to uh, the target uh, data format and load it and uh, transform it so that it fits into Alma and configure Alma. So uh, a, a brief, uh, brief overview of what we found, uh, what Alma's REST API is for us. Um, Alma's REST API is first of all extensive, and that's great. Um, I think that's one of the real benefits of the Alma system that you have an extensive um, API and it is documented. Uh, you have the link then in the, um, in the slides, but you probably all know the Alma documentation anyway. Um, and it's documented and that's even better. Uh, the documentation and the implementation is fairly consistent. Um, as it is a real world application, fairly consistent means that it is usually consistent and there might be slight, uh, slight things you have to learn on the way as you go, uh, which might differ from what you expect. Um, yeah, we have a payload description for all requests, uh, which is good. And they have a schema, which is also good. Um, sometimes you can omit uh, fields um, that are intended to be required and it still works, that's okay. Um, so there's some vagueness around that, but it's, uh, it's something very workable. 
and uh, the actual endpoint, uh, the meanings of the endpoint, what you can do with it, and the operations you have on data and on sections of ALMA. Uh, and the fourth uh, point, which is technically interesting, is that the open API specifications are, are available on uh, different specifications for the individual parts of the API. So um, there's one for acquisitions, one for bibliographic records, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, all in all, all main points uh, you um, you might encounter in Armor are somewhat represented in the API. Not all functionality, though, but um, but uh, some things uh, reflect usually. The API, as any system, has some limits. Um, they are most of them are intentional. Um, one very intentional limit is that you have uh, 25 requests per second. Um, that is not just uh, a limit, but also a challenge. Um, we come later to that. Um, uh, you cannot have more than 25 uh, requests per second. Otherwise, you get a HTTP uh, status uh, 492, uh, 429, too many requests. Um, yesterday, I was wondering if that did change at some point because I was a bit uh, confused because Alma was just dropping connections after after a lengthy period of time. But I think that was just Sunday, and so um, as with any system, error handling and um, taking into consideration that different things might happen at a different time are also important to have. Um, Yesterday, my, my code examples didn't work, so I was a bit worried. And uh, today, this morning, they worked. And um, I'm quite confident and positive that we can have a look at them. And there's a daily limit usually based on named users. And so everything I will show you uh, after this uh, might be handled with care. Because uh, if you're in an institution that is a bit smaller than we are, um, you might find that if you try what I would try online right now, you might run off out of request uh, pretty soon. Um, so consider your uh, limit. You find the limit in the API console uh, in the um, where you configure the API keys and um, you can see how much he has used. Um, so be careful not to block other other usages you, you need the API for. And also limits are shared within institutions. So um, if I do 10 requests per second, another one does another 10 requests per second, then there's just five requests per second left. So um, that's important to take into account. So challenge number one that we face uh, is requests need time. <laughs> it's uh, obvious, but um, uh, for sure, a request need time, time vary. There's a system on the other end of the cloud um, we cannot really look deeply into, so we need to um, to be flexible and we need to take into consideration that it might behave differently at different times. So a request might be quick one time or slow the other time, but we need to cope. Um, most requests need way more than one twenty-fifth of a second, so that's 40 milliseconds, if I'm not completely mistaken. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's another challenge. So we could not just do a stupid and easy loop and uh, then we're set. And we need to adjust the speed of Alma, making sure not moving too fast and yet moving as quickly as possible or as sensible. Good. Challenge number two, um, ARM's API is highly structured. So um, uh, highly structured um, API calls for abstraction and reuse. So we have, um, we have BIP here, for example, that represents a bibliographic entity and BIBs, um, note the plural, that's the box where all the BIBs are in. Same here, holdings, and in this holdings area, there lives a holding. Same with items, loans, requests. It's basically all the same. And many of these objects, um, I call it uh, API object right now, 
um, share some common features. Most of them can be um, instantiated in a certain way and things like that. But we have relations, interrelations, and we have different areas and we have specific things we can do. And we don't want to re-implement uh, everything we have implemented for a BIP, also for the items or for vendors, but we want to reuse it. So that's a challenge too. But what is the challenge with, without a quest? So we selected a game mode here, I don't know which, um, but uh, I think we, we tried to do our best, maybe somewhere between normal and super. And um, quest number one is the rate limiting because um, whatever you do, you, you need to make sure that uh, Alma just does not start rejecting your request because a rejected request is a not fulfilled request and you want the request to be fulfilled. So um, the limiting on the Alma side is based on requests per second, no m matter how long the re request takes, um, no matter what else is happening on the system. Um, some strategies for pooling and throttling are not perfect for Alma. Um, so looping and waiting is one strategy to um, to work uh, with a sequence of requests and not uh, not um, going beyond a certain threshold. But that does not work because we don't know um, how long they take, and that's only useful for requests that are much faster than. Um, and the fraction of the limit a single request may take. But Alma, in many cases, where I have an operation on something, um, has to do some things in the background, and that takes time, apparently. Um, so it's only useful for fast requests um, and highly dependent on request duration. Um, threading would, would be another option. Consider just having 100 threads. Um, a request takes uh, between one and three seconds, though we are pretty close to the threshold. Um, but yeah, requests vary. And if you have threads, you can, they can either starve because if you have some requests at some point that take longer, um, um, that keeps you um, going slower and slower. Or on the other end, if, if Alma gets quicker, you will hit the limit. And if you hit the limit, your record will be rejected. So, and then it comes also the overhead yeah, for managing threads and bringing back uh, the results. Some, some programming environments have good abstractions for that. Um, some are more, some are less complex, but threads are usually a big overhead uh, in any case uh, in the footprint. And, mm, other strategies match uh, much better. Um, so we found that non-blocking approaches uh, with callback back handlers um, uh, are a very good approach, uh, rather lightweight. Uh, so you don't have to um, instantiate a full thread and uh, passing uh, objects back and forth, but uh, you could uh, work in a non-blocking manner and uh, enter the callback handler. That's the point where we uh, decided to, um, to use Node.js or JavaScript uh, because uh, JavaScript is, uh, especially in Node.js and the processing model, um, very, very much optimized for um, waiting for stuff uh, and getting back uh, at a certain position in the code um, without uh, having uh, much uh, to think about. So um, I want to go in a code example. Um, the code example is here. I hope uh, the window switch has worked. Um, if not, please raise your voice. First of all, I want to have a look at uh, what, what happens if I, if, I, if I export a function, Alma request, uh, I put the authorization in here. It's a simple curl request. Um, and uh, enter the BIP test API. That's a trivial test, of course, um, but I want to do it nevertheless, just to see whether whether Alma actually does um, um, 
the threshold handling and uh, returns the appropriate uh, codes. The codes are the last three uh, bytes uh, I get here, and that's what I output. Um, export. So I do this with GNU parallel in, in 100 um, parallel uh, threads, or at least, yeah. Um, as many as it gets, it's a sequence of one to thousand. Um, if you do something like that, be sure that, ah, uh, and there you see, I can abort it. Um, there you see, I start getting four, uh, 29 responses, uh, not just 200. That means I, I pretty frequently hit the limit here. So this is good because yesterday evening it was not the case and I was worried that uh, the whole presentation didn't work. So what what did we do? We uh, tried to uh, abstract uh, the rate limited request uh, or we implemented the rate limited request which is basically a token based um, limiting bucket uh, based on node fetch. Uh, initially it was based on request but request is a deprecated um, library um, as of now, and so we switched to node fetch um, behind the scenes, but uh, the name was kept. Rate limited request is, um, well, it, it, it has a certain limit, limit per second. Um, I also give it a timeout, and uh, that's how it, instantiate it. it is instantiated. Of course, I also give the um, authorization header because otherwise uh, there won't be any results. Then some callback handlers just to see what the thing is doing. Um, I have a, a throttle in this um, um, rate limited request. That means um, the throttle is uh, taking care of having 25 um, or 24 in this case, see here, uh, requests per second and um, when when I'm too fast and it uh, emits a 429 and it needs to retry, then I get a retry event from, from my library and I get a throttle and I'll throttle event in case it adjusts um, the threshold. Why is that useful? It's useful if you have um, many different people working uh, in the same institution, for example, in a network zone, you don't want them to compete uh, with the 25 uh, limit, but you want to to adjust uh, to what is possible. And if, um, yeah, if you make good progress, uh, then I'll throttle after a while. What is this? This is a simple uh, for loop. Um, I just sum up the pending uh, request here to see uh, how many there are. And then I, uh, I have this simple request which returns a promise. A promise is a venable, so I have a then I have an error handling here, which is in this case, of course, of course trivial. And I have a finally, whatever should be done when, when this is rejected or resolved. And I want to try this now. So this is a loop of total requests, uh, 100 now. So that should be rather quick. Uh, it's, it's for a second. We see that we have uh, parallel instances. We have pending records here. That's actually, that's the really in parallel running um, um, request. So we have at the beginning, it's, it's, it's pretty many because it bursts and um, Alma needs some time to adjust. And then you see it going down because it's a really trivial request and, uh, and Alma is pretty fast with that. Um, but there's no 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 indication of any throttling and unthrottling going on. If we increase the number of requests a little bit and uh, are a bit bold with the rate limit, going for 100 requests a second and total requests of 500. Um, I, I cancel that just because we have already seen what, what happened. So it, it's throttling down. It's throttling down even further. It would throttle down until um, until at some point I reach um, the twenty uh, the twenty five limit because it tries retries and whenever I I hit a retry, it's throttling even further. And so that will 
accumulate in that. Good, so we have a first challenge that we um, accepted and I think uh, somehow sorted out. So we are in the position to, um, to make requests now, not uh, overdoing it with Alma. So we usually start with 24, so we're slightly below the threshold. And um, because there's no point in, in asking for 100 requests uh, if um, the limit is 25. It's just for, um, for demonstration purposes. Yeah, then we have a quest two. Uh, I will get back uh, later to that, but, uh, but consider that. Um, we have a limit of parallel requests. Uh, what if requests take really long? Imagine requests taking one second, three seconds, or five seconds. If, if I, uh, no matter what, uh, emit uh, 25 requests per second, and I have 25 requests in parallel um, when I have a one second uh, request duration in average. Uh, if it's five, it's, it's, uh, it's even five times that. Um, so um, at some point, uh, I really have to think about memory footprint. I have to think whether it's feasible to have so many network so sockets open. And then also I have to think uh, whether it's really useful uh, or it's really speeding things up to uh, hammer armor. So we don't want to do that. So we want to have some limit for the parallel request as well, not just the temporal limit. So our motto is be gentle to armor because in fact, performance might decrease, uh, especially in write operations when you do too many parallel requests. And for example, given 900,000 operations as for loading an institution with 300,000 bits, holding the items in parallel, yes, but only to some extent, if you would uh, really emit, uh, as I did before in a loop, all those uh, request uh, no notifications, it would have an insane uh, local memory footprint. Um, and um, yeah, even though the rate limited request would only spawn 25 uh, requests per second. But there's a way out. Um, so, whoops, where is it? There's a way out. Um, the way out is pool-based processing. Others say stream processing. Stream is the, um, the terminology um, JavaScript uses for that or Node.js uses for that. It is, um, I have a stream target uh, or a stream um, sync. And this is uh, basically uh, signaling that it can, can take uh, um, can take some, uh, some input. So for example, we have the final destination of our process is standard out. Standard out usually signals that it can read. And um, so the next step would be backwards. Um, that's important to uh, notice. Would uh, signal that it can read since there are no requests uh, pending. So create request um, signals that it needs some input to create a request. For example, a list of URLs could be individually uh, in imported into or written into the create request um, um, pipe. And um, so this input source would start writing um, because this is the initial source. This is some, some place where information comes from. Uh, would write to create request until this block. Um, well, and this would in turn create request and write to parallel limit, which is, um, uh, um, which is a stream that uh, can read and write and takes uh, account of how many parallel requests uh, or promises um, I have pending currently. And whenever, um, whenever I hit uh, this 25 limit, this signals um, the upstream um, streams uh, that, uh, that uh, it won't read anymore. And this block is uh, propagated upstream. Uh, that's very helpful because I, in this point, I stop uh, reading from input and I don't uh, get a mem memory um, overflow or it just, not, just doesn't grow anymore until um, the parallel limit signals that I can read again. So whenever a request is done in this parallel limit, parallel limit types of the result to the destination and um, yeah, if previously blocked, signals to be ready for more. And uh, to 
enjoys this even a little bit more. So I have to find the correct example now. So there it is. Good. Go to the top. Now we have the rate limited request uh, again. Then we have something in our library we call parallel promise throttle pipe. It's an insane name, I know, but it's it's a sticking name um, and we have re readable and transform here because we want to do something. So this is rather a code demonstration. And we have this part we know, we initialize the rate limited request and we have um, our on events. Uh, they are not so important in this case. And we have a number of requests. So we fill an array with um, with these uh, requests so that we have something to iterate over, uh, which is important because otherwise it would be difficult to form a stream. And that's what I do. I do uh, form a stream from input. Uh, input is the array of numbers of 200. I pipe this into a transformation. This transformation is a simple request. That's just the box we've seen before. And this passes on as a callback, um, the simple request, that's a promise um, to this parallel throttle uh, thing. It's initialized by default uh, without any other ado to a limit of 25 in parallel. And whenever this emits some data, this may, makes uh, the whole thing flow in the end. It's, uh, it's, it's reading and reading and reading. And, uh, indicates how many are actually parallel uh, running in this uh, throttle um, queue. Uh, this is the queue where the unresolved promises live. So let's have a look how this fares in time. Oh, that was a bit quick, a bit too quick. Yeah, that's the wrong example. And there we see um, it's usually 24, sometimes it's uh, 23, and then in the end uh, it, it, it goes down. So we have at no point more than 25 requests in parallel, uh, which makes uh, things may maybe slightly slower, but uh, not immensely and much gentler on the target system and also gentler on our system. Good, yep. Uh, the next uh, aspect is finding an appropriate abstraction. Uh, abstraction, abstraction of the API. So um, I indicated that we are using Node.js. I indicated that we use JavaScript. So we have a functional environment. We have an environment that is event-based and processing, and we can have um, promises. We can wait on promises. We can use callbacks to get back to the processing loop. So all these things are very useful in working asynchronously. But we also have um, have a, yeah, some sort of um, class system that's um, uh, very JavaScript specific. Uh, with ECMAScript 6, there's um, a slightly, well, there's some sugar over it, uh, but it's still um, a prototype-based um, inheritance, which uh, yeah, developers need to get used to before uh, before really doing something useful with it. Um, so it has some caveats, especially when uh, mistaking JavaScript for Java. So many uh, parts of the API share similar logic. Uh, CRUD is great, uh, retrieve, update, and delete is common for many areas, specifically bibliographic information that's rather consistent. And it's consistently using the HTTP verbs, which is good, um, post, put, delete, uh, or get um, for the um, related actions, create, update, and retrieve. Usually they are also called that in the, um, the, the rightmost label in the, um, in the documentation, which is good. Operations such as starting jobs, scanning of items, managing uh, set members are also similar, um, and they are all done via post. So, um, there's just one, one implementation to rule them all in the end. So 
we try to distinguish two things. Uh, the first thing is uh, we try uh, to identify an API endpoint. An API endpoint is anything where specific entities live in an address and where I can list them. For example, in concept, uh, there live many entities of the type set. Um, and in const jobs, it's similar. These are top level. Um, top level in the sense that um, that they don't uh, have a, an instance below themselves. And then we have, for example, also jobs, job ID and instances. Instances is in itself is also an endpoint. But, oops, I hear something calling. That's okay. Um, instances are also um, here an endpoint in, in this way, an endpoint where I can list these job instances, uh, holdings the same and items also. So that means uh, in the end that um, API objects bear API endpoints in the end. So um, a bib has an holdings endpoint or is an endpoint with the sub path um, holding. And then we have an API object that's an, any API path addressing a singular entity, uh, identifiable entity. Basically, anything that ends with an ID the address. That's, that's quite useful. Um, so I think here I wanted to go back to some code. Yeah. So this is a rather similar uh, example to the one before. I have an API endpoint and an API connection, but uh, the processing is now rather different. Uh, we do make a main function, which is just a wrapper to have it async, um, async so we can use await uh, as a keyword um, for asynchronous processing. And that's I call in the end. So that's just a wrapper function. Um, we build an API connection. An API connection is an API key, basically, that targets um, a specific institution. Then I have a timeout of, of a minute. Um, and I have an API endpoint. Uh, I can just initialize it like that. Um, it bears the connection because it's specific to a connection. And it has an API path uh, that's conf. Um, so we are in the conf API. And then we retrieve a set list, a set list, um, set uh, object set uh, uh, means we have the API endpoint sets. Um, and this has a master uh, object, which is uh, in turn anything an API endpoint can list. So I list the set beyond uh, the conf. I could have put conf slash sets here and leave that empty. That would have also worked. And then I iterate over this, and um, as I just, uh, um, you see, I just get the first 10 results because I have not set it uh, pageable, um, but I can add to the pageable endpoint. I haven't tried that at home, so it might go wrong. Um, but you see, um, there are many more coming now, so it's, it's listing many more results. So the paging and all that is, uh, is also captured in our um, endpoint uh, abstraction, and you don't have to worry about that when, when actually working with the Alma API. Um, that's much easier now. So we have uh, the connection management, everything just works, and uh, we don't need to worry very much. Um, about a non um, non functional or non uh, domain specific stuff so how how did we do that? I hope I have still some minutes time um, We have an API path here we have um, a pageable endpoint uh, I showed you that just that. Uh, we have a page size um, which is usually hundred with alma um, or can be 100 at the, at the max, and that's what we are going for to, to because we want to save some time in requesting. 
Um, then we have an API object, which is specific. It, 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 it has also the same API path as the endpoint, and but an ID additional to that, for sure. And I can retrieve, create, update, delete, or operate on this object then. I can instantiate it with a body or an ID, doesn't matter what. Uh, if I want to update or create, I need a body apparently, otherwise it raises an exception. Um, but I can also, for example, fetch it from Alma and then make it create and get a new one. It returns uh, always a promise on itself. Uh, so when it's done, you have this the object as such uh, um, in, in the hand. And then there's the Alma API connection that is uh, used. When an API endpoint um, delivers an object, um, it inherits uh, or it gives its child um, the Alma connection. So it, we're in the same instance. Good. Yeah, now quickly, um, of course, you, you can add uh, more wrappers like zip, holding, item, where you have specific uh, endpoints for listing, uh, for example, holdings, uh, then you don't need to um, know or remember the exact specifications for that or items, uh, which is always a wrapper on, around this object uh, interface where I um, get objects from an API endpoint below um, this. So these are very, very lightweight uh, gla classes uh, and the heavy lifting is done in API objects. So the quest four, and that's the last and uh, for, for this presentation is why not wrap this all in two? Uh, because we have the rate limiting, we have achieved that, um, and we have found how to do sensible parallelism, um, and we do, don't want to do that again and again and again. And uh, reading and writing from sources works, um, and yeah, to build a tool that is easily extensible would be very nice. And what we have done, or what we are doing right now, is uh, having an armor command, and I know that's trademarked, um, but um, and that has a bit section, a set section, then we know which endpoint we we're working with, and then we have uh, more, more or multiple action specifications, um, where, uh, for example, retrieve, uh, searching for, um, mutilating um, uh, and a specific object, uh, transforming it and putting it back, back again can happen. Um, yeah, how, how does it work? You notice uh, it looks very much like the pipe uh, we had before. We have an input, for example, ID or a query. We have a parallel limit between any step we do. So, so we don't get, um, um, yeah, we don't run into extreme memory situations or extreme um, uh, network situations. And we have some action and in the end, we have an, a destination. So that's pretty. Pretty easy. An action spec has a name. Apparently, the name is oriented uh, towards what, what Alma provides as a name. And uh, you can also provide parameters. The parameters are also named just as, uh, as an Alma um, in the API. And if you look at the API, the specific thing, then you have it documented. What we plan to do is uh, to read uh, the um, um, open API specification to um, get some user um, info on what is available to what command. And there we have a module path where we can just, for example, extract body out of it or list the holdings, list items, list them that are available. So, but I think I need to go to a demo. So um, I export the path uh, of my local installation. I have this uh, here. So uh, where is Alma? Oh, no. Yeah. For example, I have uh, Alma set, um, query set type itemized retrieve ID. And uh, I try it and I see it does what it should do. It's not super, super quick right now. That's what I told. Sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow. But it, you get an image. Um, when I don't, um, when I just query without retrieving, it's much quicker. Then I also can get the ID. 
but I don't have the additional request uh, on each uh, item. What's the difference? This yields sets. This yields the sets um, again, but does a retrieve action on each um, set uh, I get. And that just extracts the ID. So I can also have something like a query name VL. I think we have something here. That's with the retrieve, that's low. And there you see what you get. Of course, you could also get the body. Yeah. And of course, this uh, can be rather well extended uh, because you can, whenever you have something, uh, you, you get the object again and uh, invent a new stream that uh, takes uh, the API object as an input and does something with it and uh, just returns it as, a, as an output. Um, yeah, that's what we're building right now. And um, yeah, thanks for listening and um, your interest. Thank you, Stefan. Are there uh, any questions? We have time for one question. Okay, so if you have questions for Stefan, you can send them to us, put them in the Q&A and we'll pass it on to uh, Stefan. Thank you, Stefan.